Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the second in the series, Evenings of the Genome for the Year. My name is Raghu. I'm a research professor here in Genome Sciences, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Trisha Davis from Biochemistry. She's the chair of the Department of Biochemistry. Um, she got her undergraduate degree from UC Santa Cruz in 1976, I believe, and then went on to Yale to do her PhD on viruses that infect bacteria. And something unusual about these viruses is that they have lipids, which fatty molecules that most viruses don't have, uh, bacterial viruses don't have. Following that, I think she had a complete switch in her field because she went back to California to work on calmodulin for her uh, postdoctoral work. Calmodulin is a protein in the cell that binds to calcium and turns out to, be re to have really key roles as kind of an internal messenger for a whole variety of functions. And one of those functions has to do with a structure called the spindle, which I'm sure Trisha is going to tell you more about. The spindle is this really beautiful structure whose is really crucial role is in segregation of chromosomes. So every time a cell divides, the duplicated chromosomes two copies of the chromosomes that have been replicated have to be pulled to opposite sides. And the cell builds this elaborate machinery, starting with uh, kind of a handle on the chromosome and this really beautiful structure that grabs onto the chromosome and pulls the two copies to opposite sides. And that's what Trisha has been working on for the last several years and is absolutely at the forefront of understanding how the structure works. To my mind, she's taken an engineer's approach where she's taken the structure apart and is putting the structure back together in a test tube to understand how it works. And this is not just idle curiosity. I mean, we are curious about how this whole structure works, but it's also central to understanding many forms of uh, human disorders, including birth defects and chromosomal abnormalities that can occur during uh, progression of cancer. So really understanding how the structure works is going to have, you know, it's, it's really important for uh, biology in general and medicine uh, in particular. Um, 
don't want to take up too much more of Trisha's time, so let her speak, uh, talk about ensuring an equal genetic inheritance. I'll just say that there will be refreshments outside afterwards. You know, once Trisha's given her talk, there'll be time for a few questions in here, and then we can adjourn to the lobby outside where there will be refreshments. And Trisha has uh, generously offered to stick around for a little while to answer more questions if they come up. So without further ado, Trisha. Thank you, Raghu, for that great introduction and actually a, a synopsis of my entire seminar. <laughs> so shall we just go have the refreshments right now? I, why not? Okay. So as Raghu explained, and, and it might be seem sort of odd that the chair of biochemistry, who is a card-carrying biochemist, is speaking for in a genome science uh, seminar series. But as Raghu explained for the last 25 years, my lab has been interested in figuring out how the cells ensure the integrity of the genome during cell division. And in order to give an idea about how difficult a problem that really is, let's think about just how many cell divisions happen. So here we have an embryo dividing, and you're watching from the outside of the embryo, and you can see multiple cell divisions are taking place. And this is occurring over a period of five hours, so the movie's actually sped up a thousand times. And now you have about a thousand to two thousand cells, but you've only gotten to the blastula stage. You haven't even gotten close to being an adult. So two thousand cells get you just a little bit of the way into being an adult. But how many divisions do you think it takes to become an adult? Anybody have a, an idea? How many? Take a choice. You know it's more than 2,000. What do you think it is? A trillion. Very close. <laughs> Multiply that times 100, and you've got the right numbers. 100 trillion cell divisions to go from a single egg to an adult, a human adult. And if you don't have a feel for how big 100 trillion is, I suppose you might have remembered when Apple reached a tr being worth a trillion dollars and that was the biggest corporation around. This is a hundred Apple corporations, right? It's a lot, it's a big number. So you can see how in, in those cell divisions, it's really important that the genome integrity be maintained. It's really important that at every division, each daughter cell gets a full genome and not just part of a genome. Okay, so here we're looking at the outside of an embryo. Let's go in and look at the inside of an embryo. So now we're only looking at the nucleus. You can't really see the cells, although the cells are here, and this is a sand, actually a sand dollar embryo. And we, we study embryos like the sand dollar embryo and the zebrafish embryo and um, sea urchin embryos because they're very easy to study and also it would be very difficult and probably not ethical to do this in human embryos. Uh, however, so here we're looking just at the nucleus, and the blue dots are the chromosomes. So let's watch what happens to the chromosomes as the cell division occurs. They collapse into a line, and they separate into two equal sets. And to see again, they collapse into a line, and they segregate into two equal sets. So this process is called mitosis. And it was first named about 150 years ago. And the word mito is a Greek word for thread. So why did the scientists, peering through their very primitive microscopes 150 years ago, think to call this, name this after the Greek word for thread? The reason is, is because at some stages of the cell cycle, the chromosomes look like threads, and they actually are threads. Chromosomes are long threads of DNA, and they're wrapped around protein balls. So here's a DNA helix. I'm sure many of you have seen a picture like this. And a chromosome is one giant long DNA helix. However, it's not just naked DNA. The DNA helix is wrapped around these protein balls, and then even wrapped further so that in mitosis, it's very tightly packed into what we like to draw as just a long rod because it's so tightly packed. And actually, if you look in uh, cells under certain conditions, the chromosomes sort of look like this. So uh, to make this more clear, we're going to do a demonstration. <laughs> My helpers. 
<laughs> so imagine that this scarf is a strand of DNA. This is not yet a chromosome because it's just a strand of DNA. So what happens is that to make a chromosome is the strand of DNA is wrapped around protein balls as such and then condenses even more tightly. Now one of the protein balls is very special. So this is a white ball. We'll come back to how special this is, but it's wrapped around a very special sequence of DNA in a very special place in the chromosome, and then we go back to the regular tennis balls. So at the end of this whole wrapping process, <laughs> you have a tightly wrapped chromosome ready for mitosis. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, okay, so chromosomes are also blueprints. And just as this blueprint are the instructions how to build every part of a house, the chromosomes are the blueprints for how to make every protein in a cell. They're the blueprints how to make a cell. So as you, do you, people know how many chromosomes humans have? 46, so humans have 46 chromosomes, that's the human genome. And that genome are the instructions to build a human. So you can see, since chromosomes are instructions, it's very important that in every cell division, every cell gets a complete set of instructions. So as I said, chromosomes were discovered about 150 years ago. And the very first big question that occurred to people is what are they? What are they doing? And in, a, in the next 50 or so years, it was determined that they were likely to be the hereditary material. However, it was known chromosomes were protein and something else called nucleic acid. And it wasn't clear whether it's the protein or the DNA that was, new, that was the hereditary material. And that wasn't proven for another 20 or 30 years. But once that was figured out, then people really start, wanted to understand how do the chromosomes duplicate themselves? How do they, we call it replication. How do they replicate? How do they organize themselves? How do they separate into two equal sets in every cell division? And what happens if they don't? What I want to tell you about today is our work studying this fourth one and how do they separate into two equal sets. But this bottom question is really important. What happens if a cell doesn't get a complete genome? Well, usually the cell dies, and so that's the end of that cell. And if it's not really needed, that's not so bad. But sometimes, if it doesn't get the full genome, but it gets just the right number, just the right uh, combination of chromosomes, it can stay alive, and that's one of the steps towards cancer. And of course, if you're talking about your germ cells, as Regu says, if as of making eggs and sperm, you don't have the right number of chromosomes, then that can lead to various um, birth defects. So it's a very important process. Now to understand this process, we're going to do a demonstration. So come here. So we have a spindle pole in red. Where's my other spindle pole? And the spindle poles <laughs> are throwing out ropes that they're going to use to catch the chromosomes. And in this cell, don't get caught yet, in this cell, we have a blue chromosome and we have a turquoise chromosome. So the first thing is the chromosomes have to replicate. And, <laughs> and at this stage, we have two sisters and they are identical copies of each other. We didn't have any identical twins, so you'll have to really leave with me. And we have another set of sisters, and they're identical copies of each other. But note that they are holding on still, all right? And now the poles will throw out the ropes to catch the, <laughs> the sisters' <laughs> hands. <laughs> and the ropes actually are pulling on the sisters and they are holding on to each other so they are under tension there's actually a force being exerted on the sisters all right and then when everybody's aligned like they are now both chromosomes are aligned the sisters let go and they are pulled to opposite poles 
And here we end up with a cell that will be very happy because it has a turquoise chromosome and a blue chromosome. And here the other cell will have a turquoise chromosome and a blue chromosome. So everything has worked perfectly well. Now, sometimes that isn't the way things go. So sometimes we have replicated sisters and both sisters attach to the same pole this way, Rose, this side. <laughs> and now you can see that these, even though it, uh, the sisters are attached, even once they let go, they're going to be pulled to the same pole. And then you will end up with a cell that has only a dark blue chromosome and another cell that has two copies of the turquoise chromosome and one of the dark blue chromosome. Obviously, this is not the right number. All right, so the cell doesn't want this to happen at all. And so there's a process to detect these mistakes first and to correct them. And that process is that a magic wand comes in known as a protein kinase and makes that sister let go of the wrong side so that it can catch, not be tempted, don't be tempted, and catch the other side. And then they'll be under tension. And so now we know they're correct, and then they'll let go and segregate properly to the right side. Thank you very much. Okay, so, <laughs> so just to go through this quickly, we have a chromosome and it has a very special structure on it and it will replicate and these two replicas are exact copies of each other and they're called sister chromatids in the case of the chromosome. They are held together by rings of protein. And we have spindle poles that are shooting out microtubules, which we're showing as ropes. And notice the ends of the ropes are frayed, and that's important, because the microtubules are actually unraveling during this process and also retwining up again. The very special structure on the chromosome is called centromeres, and the centromeres are the special location where the kinetochores form. So kinetochores we're showing as hands. But what kinetochores actually are, are a collection of about 40 proteins organized together. And this is what we're interested in studying, and I'll get to the why in a minute. So the hands then reach out and capture the microtubules. And as I said, the microtubules are pulling on the hands, and the hands are pulling on the chromosomes but the chromosomes are held together, so they can't come apart yet. So the middle of the chromosome here, this specialized region called the centromere, those sister centromeres are actually being pulled apart, and this is under, called under tension. Okay, and this tension is important because it's the signal that this is a correct attachment. It's a signal that this sister is attached to this pole and this sister is attached to this pole. Now, like I said, well, I, I, that isn't the way it always happens. You might think chromosome segregation is so important. Making sure there's complete inheritance of the genome and exactly right every single cell division, that is so important. It is really important. So you might think it's just done right from the very beginning. But as we showed you, there in the begin when cells set up and attach the microtubules to the chromosomes, in almost every cell division, mistakes are made first. It's just not done right from the beginning. So there has to be a way to correct the mistakes. And the signal for an incorrect attachment is low tension, because here we have both sisters connected to the same pole, like we showed you in the demonstration. There's no tension between them. So that's seen as incorrect, that's unstable, and it's made to detach. Sometimes the, the, uh, the unattached hand here goes back and just reattaches incorrectly again. But then it will be detached again. And then eventually it will attach correctly. And when it is attached correctly, it's under tension. And that's a signal to stabilize this attachment. That's a good attachment. And once all the chromosomes are attached correctly, then they separate. So the process of mitosis with this error correction mechanism is a really good analogy for life and for living because nobody leads a perfect life. 
we go through life, we make mistakes. We need an error correction mechanism to, to, to correct those mistakes and try again. And even if we reattach it to the wrong side again, we get another chance and eventually we can get it right. Okay, so in this process, I would like to put forward the idea that basically the kinetic cores are doing all the work. Because look, they're, they're holding on to the microtubule. I mean, sure, the spindle poles are throwing out these microtubules, that's important. And actually we studied this and it's really interesting. But for today's talk, we're looking at the kinetic core. The kinetic core holds on to the microtubule, it holds on to the DNA. This microtubule is actually fraying. And it's, so it's acting as a bridge between these two and has to do it while the chromosome is trying to pull it off the end of the microtubule. So the kinetic core stays attached to this fraying microtubule while the chromosome is trying to pull it off, which is just like this poor cat trying to stay attached to this fraying rope while gravity is trying to pull it down. So because the kinetic cores are at the center of this process, we are very interested in how they work. We want to know how do they act as a connection? How do they bridge the chromosome and the microtubule? How do they do this while staying attached to a fraying microtubule and while, and while uh, under tension? So we are biochemists. So we take a biochemical approach to this problem. And the approach is called reconstitution. And reconstitution is a gold standard for a biochemist. And what that means is you take a process or you take a molecular machine, you take the whole thing apart, willy-nilly, and then you try to put it back together again and make it do what it's supposed to do. And if you can do that, that means you understand every single part of that process. And so that's what we're trying to do in the kinetic core. So we go through and we try to answer each of these questions. What does it do? What does it look like? What are the parts? We, try to, we make all the parts individually. Then we try to see what each part does. Do the parts, how do the parts assemble? And how do the parts work together? This is, this is a fundamental idea in biochemistry. And even though I'm speaking to genome science, I want you to understand this very important biochemical concept. So I'm going to give you an example. Reconstitution of a truck with a driver. So we have a truck and we have a parts list. And we have a general image, the image of the truck on the box. So we sort of know what it looks like. And then we have all the isolated parts. We have a pile of chassis, a pile of wheels, frames, uh, truck beds, and the driver. So as biochemists, we have all these parts separated out. Now we want to look to see what the parts do. So OK, what do wheels do? Well, wheels roll. But this is just one wheel by itself. And so it's rolling, but it could fall over. It's not very stable. And we know that in a truck, the wheels are stable. And so we want to figure out how do we make this wheel more stable? Well, we think, well, we've got to add another part of the truck. So what part of the truck do we add? Well, we look around and we see, well, these frames, they seem to have perfect places for wheels to fit into. And you can fit four wheels in, and that really stabilizes their behavior. And now you have four wheels all working together. So we've assembled, we've assembled the wheels onto the frame. And you keep on with that logic until you assemble the whole truck. And now you're ready to test it. OK. So with the kinetic core, we do exactly the same thing. It's just on a very small scale. So I'm going to go through each of these questions individually. What do kinetic cores look like? Well, the problem with looking at things that are inside cells is they're really small. So they're really hard to see. And so notice this is 100 nanometers. And if you don't have a feel for how big 100 nanometers is, that's 1 1,000th one the size of a the sheet of paper, the, the thinness of a sheet of paper. So that's really small. So that means we can't really see them unless we do something like electron microscopy. And even then, we can't really see. I mean, this is not as clear as a truck. But we can see a microtubule. And the purple is the kinetic core. 
and we're sort of get a feeling that it's spread out around the microtubule. There might be a ring here, there might be some rods. But this is as far as we got in understanding what it looks like. And next is what are the parts? So the parts are a small piece of the chromosome, that very special piece of the chromosome that wrapped around the white ball. And then there is five protein complexes and a microtubule. Now discovering the parts of something that's very small and inside the cell is really hard. And this was the work of very many labs. And what happens, how you, how you do this, how you build up a structure like this, is somebody somewhere has got to find one protein. They have to find one piece of this kinetic cord, one part of the hand. So if somebody could find a thumb, then you can start looking for all the rest. So once you have one, then that one allows you to find another one, which allows you to find two or three more, and you bootstrap your way up into finding all the parts. This took about 15 years from the time that the very first one was discovered until we knew all of these pieces. We knew about microtubules for decades, but it took a lot longer to get the rest of the pieces. The next step is to, once you know what the parts are, you want to manufacture them. So if you're working with a truck, you manufacture all the parts in the Tory factories, and each part is in its own part of the Tory factory. In the kinetochore, you express the parts in bacteria, and each part is expressed in a different bacterial culture. You then separate the parts by type, and with the kinetochore, you isolate each part out of the bacterial culture, and it's a little bit tricky because you don't want any contaminating bacterial proteins in there, but you can work that out. There are standard ways to do that. And so now we have all the isolated parts of a truck, and we have all the isolated parts of a kinetic core. So let me explain this a little bit. These obviously are not proteins, or maybe not, but they're not proteins, they're just cartoons. We've based the cartoons loosely on what we know these protein complexes look like, but we actually don't know very much about what they look like. And I didn't think it was appropriate to go deep into protein structure in a group, with a group of people interested in the genome. So I'm gonna show them as schematics. But what's shown above them is a way for us to test if this structure, if this protein complex that we have in this little test tube that we can't see because it just looks like a clear fluid in there, is it really have what we think it should have in it? And so we do something called gel electrophoresis, which allows us to separate the different proteins of this green Y-shaped structure out on the gel. So we see, oh yes, this has four proteins in it. And this one has 10 proteins in it. And that one was really hard to figure out how to express in bacteria. And then this one over here was the hardest of all for some reason. Nobody in the world could express it until Joanna Dimitrova figured out how to do it. And she quickly became one of our valuable collaborators. Okay, so we have all the parts. And as I said, there are people who are doing a lot of work to understand the structure of these parts. I'm not gonna go through that, but I just wanna show you one because it's a ring and it's really beautiful to me anyway. So JJ Miranda was the guy who figured out how to make this protein complex, and then he stuck it on microtubules. So this is an electron micrograph of a microtubule. Microtubule are, are actually tubes, uh, but in an EM, they just look like a bunch of lines, uh, and they complete, look completely flat. But now look, when he added the DAM1 complex, he sees these beautiful structures forming across them. And if you look at enough EMs, you know these are rings that are forming around this microtubule. 13 years later, another graduate student in the same lab got a much higher resolution structure. So you can really see the details of the structure. And you can see that it takes 17 DAM1 complexes all lining up around this microtubule to make the ring. And the size of the ring is perfect to fit around the microtubule, which is shown here in the dotted lines. Okay, so that's one structure. I won't show you any of the others. <clears throat> but when it was discovered that the DAM1 complex made rings, that was incredibly exciting because if you want to attach, if you want to really hang on to a cylinder, what better way than to form a ring around it and hold on? And, and so the whole field at the time went, of course that's what it would be. But of course no one figured it out ahead of time. So now, where am I? Yes. Okay, so we have the parts, 
And now we want to know what the parts do. So with the truck, we see a rope attaches to a hook and the, the truck pulls on the rope until the attachment breaks. And that's exactly what we're going to do with the chromosome, with in chromosomes and the microtubules. So what do the parts do? Well, I've already told you that the kinetochore is a bridge between the chromosome and the microtubule. That means some part has to bind the chromosome, some part has to bind to the frame microtubules, and all of this has to be done while the chromosome is trying to pull the kinetochore off the microtubule. Well, when you're doing a reconstitution experiment, you have to have a way to measure what you've reconstituted. Once you put the truck together, you want to figure out if it's behaving like a truck or not. So once we put the kinetochore together, we have to figure out, is it behaving like a kinetochore? Does it bind microtubules? Does it bind chromosomes? And can it maintain tension between the microtubule and the chromosome? Well, the assays to do these top two were pretty well worked out. We, we pretty much knew how to do that. But how do you do tension when you're talking about something so very tiny? How do you measure the tension of something that tiny? Fortunately for us, just as we were beginning to ask ourselves that question, Chip Asbury joined the University of Washington in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. And he was an expert at making something called an optical trap. And an optical trap is a way to apply force to very small things. So this laser, this laser is pushing on the screen. Light is energy and the laser is light and it's pushing on the screen. But this laser, of course, is very weak, fortunately, or we'd burn a hole right through the screen. And the screen is very big, so you can't detect the movement from that push. But imagine if this was a very strong laser and this was, instead of being a screen, was an itty bitty tiny bead, then you could use that laser to move the bead around. And Arthur Ashkin figured out that that would be true when he was at Bell Labs, and he developed that technology, and many years later, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics just last year. So this was a huge insight on his part that you could use laser light to manipulate beads. And he first used them to manipulate moving organisms like bacteria and he'd move them around. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna use laser light, a strong laser, a tiny bead, and manipulate the bead. Now in our case, we're not actually interested in the bead itself. And so what we do is we attach um, one of the kinetochore complexes to the bead. So you might think we'd put in a whole bunch of kinetochore complexes, but we don't start that way. We start with only one. So we're not looking at the whole hand. We're just looking at a couple of fingers because we want to know what the, each part does. We don't want to, we don't only want to know what the whole thing does. So we have a, a complexes coated on this bead. And then the first time we do the experiment, all we do is we just use the laser light to move the bead around and attach it to a microtubule and then we let go, and we look to see what happens. And this is what the experiment actually looks like. And here is a bead, and it's coated with the NDC80 complex, but you can't see that because it's too small. But you can see the bead, and this line here, this faint line here, that's the microtubule. So now we've used the laser trap to put that bead on the microtubule, and we're going to watch as the microtubule shortens, the bead tracks along with the end of that microtubule. All right, so that's great. That shows us that the MDC80 complex can bind a microtubule and track as it disassembles. But that isn't actually what we want to know. What we want to know is how strong is that attachment. So we want to know how strong is this attachment between an MDC80 complex and the microtubule. And so this time what we do is we use the laser light again to manipulate the bead and we move it over on top of the microtubule. But then we start pulling and we try to pull the bead off the microtubule. We use a laser to pull the bead off the microtubule and we pull stronger and stronger and stronger until it pops off. And that gives us a measure of how strong that attachment is. So, I was gonna, I, for anybody who wanted a little more detail, I was gonna give one example of raw data. 
If you don't understand it, it doesn't matter for the rest of the talk. <laughs> but here we have, we're, we're looking at one experiment and we're looking at the behavior of one bead. And we're plotting force versus time. And force is measured in PN, which stands for piconewton. So we put the bead on the microtubule and we pull at a very low force just to make sure it's really on and it's at the end of the microtubule. And then we increase the force more and more and more. So here the line shows the force is getting stronger and stronger. And then the bead pops off and the force drops to zero. And we record that and that is the strength of that the attachment between that bead and that microtubule, one experiment. And then we do that 100 times, or rather they do that 100 times. <laughs> and so when you, and this just shows you that the microtubule is getting longer. So when you do that 100 times, then you need a way to look at the data. So we use something that are called survival probability plots. And these are plots that are very commonly used like if you're doing a drug trial. And so what we're plotting here is force on the x-axis and the likelihood of survival on the y-axis. So what do I mean by survival? For well, I'm talking about a bead. But what I mean is that a bead that stays attached to the microtubule is surviving. So at very low forces, see this is like zero, 100% of the beads are attached. And at very uh, high forces, none of the beads are still attached. So at 20 picanoons, every single bead has fallen off. But what we care about is at what is the force that 50% of the beads will still be able to survive. And that, in this case, is 3.9 piconewtons. Okay, so how strong is a piconewton? Well, it's not very strong. It is the force of this laser pointer on this screen. That's a piconewton. It's also the weight of a red blood cell. It's very tiny, but if, remember, we're talking about very tiny things. And 3.9 piconewtons is the strength that you need for a chromosome to hang on to a microtubule. Of best we can tell from measurements taken in cells. Okay, so now, you know, remember we were putting the more and more pieces of the truck together, so now we're putting more and more pieces of the kinetochore together. So we're adding in the next piece, which are the DAM1 complexes. And we don't need to assemble them ahead of time. We take the DAM1 complex and we just throw it in the tube with the microtubules and with the NDC80 complex. And it self-assembles into rings. This is one of the really interesting things about biology. These structures self-assemble spontaneously. I'm sure you're well aware that a truck will not self-assemble. If you put all the pieces in a pile and you leave them overnight, when you come back in the morning, they're still just gonna be in a pile unless some toddler has come along and put in the extra energy needed to assemble this truck. But with the kinetochore and with many biological systems, you don't need extra energy. They self-assemble, they're made to do that. And so in this case, we just flow in free DAM1 complex, it assembles into a ring, it binds to the NDC80 complex, and we have the beginning of a kinetochore. And so how strong is this attachment when you anchor down the NDC80 with a ring? That's a lot stronger. And you can tell that because this survival curve is shifted to the right. And so even out here at the highest forces, some of the beads are still surviving. And in fact, what this means is it's twice as strong. And I'm just showing you the p-value to remind me to tell you that we always test statistically whether, the, the two, whether or not two different um, curves are, are, different, are actually different. Two curves are actually different. In this case, they clearly are. Uh, from the p-value because anything uh, less than 0.05 is significantly different. Okay, so um, okay, so so far, what have we shown? We've put together the hand and the thumb on the microtubule. We have DAM1 rings, NDC80, and we know the force is going through both of them to the microtubule. So, what parts are needed to pull on the chromosome? We've only deal, dealt with the whole microtubule part, but that's fine because we're biochemists and now we just want to add more and more parts in. So back to the optical trap. But this time we put a different protein on the bead and we put in all these other proteins and let again, they self-assemble. They just assemble into the right structure. And we know that because when we pull on them, this is a strong attachment. 
again, 3.9 picanutes. Now you might wonder, since this is very small and we can't actually see what's going on, really, we might wonder, how do we know this is the order? Well, we had some clues from prior work that probably it was arranged this way, but we don't actually know for sure, because for all we know, this orange guy is binding straight to the microtubule. Or maybe he's binding straight to the NDC80 complex. Maybe you don't need this one at all, the middle guy. So you have to do controls. And the first control is what I sort of call the sledgehammer approach, where you just leave a whole piece out. And if you leave that whole piece out, you find out they can't do anything. This bead cannot attach to a microtubule unless mind is present. So that gives you one hint that this is the order. But we can do much more fine tooth scalpel work. And we can just delete a little tiny piece of this protein complex. Then it's the piece that was shown to bind a mind and find, again, that completely abolishes the ability to bind to a microtubule. So that gives us confidence that this is the pathway of the force. And note, we have not yet even reached the DNA. But before we get there, I want to point out something that was really surprising to us when we saw it. And that is that this longer chain is, is actually stronger than the shorter chain. And a longer chain should not be stronger, it should be weaker. So why is this chain not weaker? And that is something that really puzzled us. So let's go and look at something at the macroscopic level. So here we have a carabiner attached to a rope and held in a vice grip. Now, the connection of the vice grip is very, very strong, and that's equivalent to the connection to our bead. We already knew that's very, very strong. But if we pulled hard enough on this, it would break. And I would like to just point out that this vice grip was my father's. And it's one of the few things we saved from his shop. And we've saved this now for 15 years. And, and my husband would say, why are we saving the vice grip from your father? And now I know. <laughs> Welcome, Dad. <laughs> All right. So this chain would break eventually if we pulled hard enough on it. And it would break here, because this connection is very strong. Now, if you add three more lo lo loops to the chain, it should break more easily because it's more, there are more places to break. So the probability of breaking goes up because now it's more likely to break because it can break at any one of these places. But that's assuming that these strengths are all equal. Our results suggest that's not true. And instead, we have very, we've added very long link, very strong links to the chain, and the weak link is still this guy. And so the probability of these are breaking is basically zero, and all of the breakages are occurring here, which is the same as here, and that's why the longer chain is the same strength as the shorter chain. That's a great idea, but that's a hypothesis. We don't actually know that's true. So we have to test this hypothesis. How can we test the hypothesis? Well, we can strengthen what we propose is the weak link with some duct tape. And if we strengthen this leak, if this is the weak link where all the breaks are occurring, then when you strengthen this, the high entire chain should get stronger or should, should be strengthened. Okay, so let's go back to the kinetic core. So here we have the NDC80 complex, one orange carabiner. And originally we thought that the longer chain would look like this, they would just all be equal strength. But we found out that wasn't, and that would be more likely to break than this guy, but it's not. And so we wondered what was going on. So then we decided, well, it must look like this. These must be very strong links, and this is the weak link. But again, this is a hypothesis. How are we going to test this hypothesis? Do we know how to strengthen this link? <laughs> yes, exactly, duct tape. But what is the duct tape for the microtubule binding protein? It's the DAM1 complex. It's the ring. The ring strengthens this and almost doubles its strength. So now we add DAM1 complex to here, and we once again, we double the strength. So that means our hypothesis was correct that the weak link is between the NDC80 complex and the microtubule, and these are much stronger links. 
And that in a way now, now that we know more about what these links look like, that makes sense because these are very greasy patches binding to other greasy patches. And then you're inside a cell, which is basically water, grease likes to interact with grease. That's a very strong interaction. And so this is grease to grease, grease to grease, and this is charge to charge. And when a charge to charge interaction in water is just not very strong. And that explains why these are so much weaker. And then they're strengthened by the dam one complex. Okay. So we've gotten through the hand and the wrist, but we have not even talked one minute about the chromosome. And this whole talk is about chromosomes. So we've got to add in a chromosome. But there's one problem because nobody yet in the world has figured out how to put a chromosome into an optical trap. So we can't use a whole long chromosome. We have to just use the little special fragment. And so we use a chromosome fragment wrapped around its protein ball. And we wanna see if these interact and if this is a strong interaction. And sure enough, they definitely interact. And that was first discovered by us. And this is a strong interaction. It's not quite as strong, but it's very close. Then we have one more piece that we don't know what it's doing. It's sticking out in the middle of nowhere and we don't know what it's doing. So we've got to add it in. And we find interestingly that you can make two different kinds of chains. You can make one with the OA, you can make one with MIF2, and they're exactly equal in strength when attached all the way from the DNA to the microtubule. And if you put them together, they're even stronger. So, we have taken all the pieces of the kinetochore. We have mixed them all together in a tube. We have allowed them to self-assemble, and we've been able to create a strong load-bearing attachment between the chromosome, or at least a chromosome fragment, and the microtubule. What have we learned? We learned that it self-assembles on its own. We learned that there's two different paths between the DNA and the microtubule. And we've learned that the whole is stronger than either path alone. So this, like I said, for a biochemist, this is a, this is a gold standard. We still have a few more things to work out, but this has been a huge accomplishment. The truck. Finally, I just want to acknowledge that uh, most of the work I talked about today was done by a single graduate student, Grace Hamilton, who is one of the spindle poles. And the microtubule binding work I talked about was done by another graduate student who was the other spindle pole, <laughs> Rachel Flores. These are the other people in my lab. Uh, we owe a great debt to Joanna Dimitrova, who's been a wonderful collaborator, an even larger debt to Chip Asbury and the people in his lab. I've been doing science for 40 years with Eric Muller, and he's also a wonderful photographer. And this is a Seattle Mitosis Club that makes a wonderful intellectual environment for us. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Oh, so, so the, the chromatin is held together with covalent bonds, and so that would be, have to be a much bigger pulling force than what we're pulling. It can't pull apart a protein. It can just pull interactions that are, say, like I said, held about like, like greasy patches or held by more likely by charged interactions. Any other questions? Yes? You mentioned uh, self-assembly. And uh, I had the impression from the way you spoke about it that it's, well, it's just a given, it happens, and that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. there, is there any research done into how it can be that things self-assemble? Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of research done into how self-assembly works and what, um, what are the specifics of the interactions that allow that to occur. And why, for example, does this protein interact with this protein and not with, and not with 10,000 other proteins? Because that, that requires, it has to be a lot of specific information. Because in a cell, we always think of cells as just being bags of proteins. 
and they are bags of proteins, but they're very compact. It's not, it's not like a soup. It's not like a very thick goulash. And so the proteins are very compact in the cell. And so you'd have, you might imagine they would just all bind to everything in there and it'd be a big fat mess. And once in a while we do make cells full of a big fat mess, but that's not on purpose. That's an accident. But in a, in a normal healthy cells, proteins very, are very good. There's a great deal of specificity. A single protein only identifies its other partner. It doesn't bind to the 10,000 other proteins there. So that's a very interesting problem that many people are working on. Yes? I understand um, just maybe a little bit about the protein. It's sort of like we're on, right? And we have folded in certain shapes. And so would that explain why the one binds to the myrrh or what? <laughs> 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 uh, binding yeah. So yes, it, it, the, the shape of the protein does determine its function, and that's very important in giving it the specificity it needs to identify what who its partner is and why it doesn't bind to something else. So proteins, when they're first made, when they're first made in a cell, they're just long strings of amino acids. But this is another example of a spontaneous self assembly process. That protein folds into a very specific shape. And that shape determines what it does, who it can interact with, what it does when it interacts. Yes? So, can we talk about these ideas that we're going to talk about? Is there an animal during the current project that didn't work out the way they started with, or the way they hoped? 99 days out of 100 experiments don't work. This is, to be a scientist, you have to have grit. You have to stick, stand up to failure every day and say, I'm gonna do this anyway. I'm gonna try it again. So yes, lots of things don't work out. But I will have to say, this project has gotten way better than many projects. And part of it is because we had a lot of great information going in. So we knew, we sort of had a path. And often the path you see when you start an experiment, like you say, is just completely wrong. You get partway through and you don't do it. But this time the path turned out to be mostly right. There still were a lot of surprises, which were fun, but they weren't overwhelming, which is nice. <laughs> yes? When you're growing these components in bacteria, do they interrupt the bacterial facility? Sometimes they do. You, often they don't. Because often you're not making enough uh, to the, so that the, as far as the bacteria is concerned, that it would bother what the bacteria is doing. Uh, but there was one protein I worked on, the calmodulin, that the minute you started expressing put into bacteria, the bacteria just stopped in their tracks. And after about two hours, the almost the only thing left in that bacteria was this protein. That was a great protein to work on. These proteins, they don't do that. <laughs> so then we have to go through a whole process to get rid of all the bacterial proteins and just end up with what we want to study. Yes? What's the next thing you're going to look at? So the things that we really want to understand there's, is uh, that connection to the chromosome. Because in something I didn't tell you is that connection to the chromosome doesn't seem strong enough in those experiments, it becomes the weakest link. And so we want to understand what we're missing in our system. For us as a biochemist, when you find something doesn't quite strong enough or doesn't work quite right, that's like a hallelujah day. We need to find something else. And then we need to go off and search for that something else. And so that's one of the uh, directions we're going is trying to figure out how we nail that onto that chromosome. Yes. So this might be uh, something in another talk, but I guess it's biochemist's job to find the protein. And I wondered if you could uh, describe how that's how it's done. How do you find a protein? And, and uh, also, how do you name the one that's been named? Who's up here? Well, I think it's a completely appropriate in the genome sciences to say that those first proteins were identified by genetics. They were actually the genes were identified by mutations in the genes. And those mutations gave a phenotype that showed they had to do something to do with the, the integrity of the genome. And so then you had one. And then 
you can take that one protein and you can use it as a fish, as a hook, and you can put a tag on it so you can pull it out and you put it into the cell and then you pull it out and you see what else comes out with it. And that is also done in the genome science department. It's called mass spectrometry. It's extremely powerful. And without it, we would still be looking for the parts because genetics gets you like this far and then using what you've got from the genetics to find the rest is, by mass spec takes you all the way there. The naming. So like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what, what are the names. Dad one. Dad one. I don't, that's one of the names I don't know. Um, So MIF2 was one of the very early ones found because it affected mitotic fidelity. DAM1 was DUO1 and um, MPS1 interactor. DUO1 is dead upon overexpression. So each of the three letters stands for how it was discovered. And, and if you work on them long enough, you start to learn those, or you forget them again. 